This is part 3 of Gin and Trouble, The Bourbon Street Bad Boys Club, Book 5. Written by Catherine M. Hurst. Narrated by Aaron Shedlock and Virginia Rose. Be sure to subscribe to Catherine's channel where you can find the conclusion of Gin and Trouble, along with more of Catherine's paranormal and contemporary romance novels. Chapter 21. Dante. I reread Frankie's text for the fiftieth time. Dante, did anyone ever tell you you're adorable when you talk in your sleep? See you soon. XOXO. I would have preferred to wake up wrapped around her warm, naked body, but I'd take what I could get. Iris glanced up from my spare computer. Any word from Frankie? Nothing yet, but I'm sure she's fine. I wasn't thrilled she'd left the building, but I couldn't keep her hostage forever. Besides, I believed her. She'd lied to help her sisters, not to spy on us for Tommaso. Now, all I had to do was trust her to come back. Marco stormed into the back cave, looked from me to Iris and frowned. We have a problem. Besides you not knowing how to knock? I went for levity, not to be a smartass, but to lighten the mood for Iris' sake. The woman had been through more than enough. She didn't need to get stuck in the middle of whatever was going on with Marco. She got to her feet. I'll go get some lunch. He gave her a quick nod before pegging me with a hard stare. Why didn't you call me about the shit going down at Enzo's? Because this is the first I'm hearing about it. The house or the restaurant? I turned to log into the security feeds. Chances were, whatever had happened had been caught on camera. There was a shooting at the restaurant. It's all over the news. How do you not know this? He motioned to the bank of monitors. My world tilted. Is it Enzo? No. But with Tommaso Abruzzo's recent departure, I'd like to know what happened. I blew out of breath and typed in the identifiers to pull up the right feeds. Next time lead with that. Seriously though, how did you not know? It hit the police scanners hours ago. I'd screwed up, overslept with Frankie, gotten distracted chatting with Iris, but none of that was any of his business. Contrary to what you might think, I don't work 24-7. I have a life. Where's Frankie? I've been meaning to have a little chat with her. That he could go from our brother possibly being shot to asking about my girlfriend so casually freaked me the hell out. The old Marco, before he'd become Capo, would have shouted, demanded, and prayed until he'd seen Enzo was safe with his own two eyes. Ignoring his questions and my growing sense of unease, I opened the first feed. I'm surprised it's taken you this long to stop by. Nico wanted to come, but the baby hasn't been feeling well. He waved his hand. Never mind that. Where... I motioned to the images of a blonde woman lying on the ground near the service entrance of the restaurant. Marco leaned closer to the monitor. Rewind and play it again. We watched the woman exit a car, glance around as if nervous and hurry to the service entrance. It appeared she rang the bell and spoke to whoever opened the door. A split second later, her head jerked to the side and, if I had to guess, she died before hitting the ground. Jesus. Marco dragged his hand down his face. Any chance you have a camera on the inside of that door? Nodding, I typed in the code to switch views. The image on the screen changed to the kitchen. In the back, right-hand corner, the service entrance was visible. I moved the video forward in increments of five seconds until Enzo stepped into the frame. He turned his head, likely hearing the buzzer, and walked to the door. Was that shot meant for him? My hands trembled to the point I had a hard time zooming in on the images. It's possible, but we need to get an ID on that woman. He took his phone from his pocket. I've been trying to reach Enzo since I heard about the shooting. The asshole had me worried sick he'd been shot. He freaking lied? Could have fooled me. You acted like you knew Enzo was fine. I pulled up video feeds of the parking lot, inside the dining room and the kitchen. Marco shrugged. The poker face is a necessity. I've learned to keep my emotions locked up, but that doesn't mean I don't feel them. I'll remember that. Have you tried to call Shauna? The last thing we needed was for Enzo's spitfire of a wife to find out about the shooting and assume the worst. She's not answering either. I did a double take at the footage from the parking lot. Shauna, a bodyguard, and Leo's girl had arrived shortly after the police. Never mind, I found her and Dahlia. Any idea what they're doing there? None, but I've never been so thankful Nico isn't close with her sisters-in-law or Dahlia. Add Maggie to the mix and you have a triple the trouble with those two. He chuckled. See what you can dig up on the victim. I need to run. Sure thing. I didn't have the heart to tell him it could be hours before I got a name on the dead woman. Marco's phone rang. A half second later, mine went off with Kincaid's ringtone. He gave me a worried look, strode a few feet away and answered. I pressed my cell to my ear. Marcion. Kincaid spoke before I'd managed to get my name out. 
Sir, we have word Enzo is en route to Tulane Medical Center. Gunshot wound to the chest. No info on his condition. My brain screeched like a dial-up modem. That's impossible. I'm looking at the security feed. The victim was female. The pounding on my front door told me there was a problem. A big one. To my left, Marco appeared to be having the same conversation, but judging by his soft, soothing tone, he was either speaking to Nico or our mother. There was a second shooting. We need to get you to the hospital. I have a car waiting downstairs. Your mother and the rest of your family are on their way. I was hurried into the back cave with Marco's bodyguards on her heels. A big guy with an even bigger gun on his hip stalked toward Marco. He spoke in Italian, but otherwise he relayed the same information as Kincaid, with one major exception. Dahlia Calhoun was also hit. Marco and I exchanged glances. His was stoic, but I was sure I looked like I was a heartbeat away from a breakdown. We trained for scenarios like this since we were preschoolers. Assassination attempts were as much a part of mafia families as cannoli at Christmas. Hell, we'd been through a similar situation three years before when our brother Joe and his wife were murdered. Same hurried phone call, same confusion, same rush to the hospital. I prayed this time would have a different outcome. I wasn't ready to say goodbye to another brother, and Leo's son sure as hell wasn't ready to lose his mom. Iris rested her hand on my arm. Go, I'll stay here and tell Frankie what's going on when she comes back. Thanks. Although her eyes were whiter than normal and her skin paler, she'd taken the news much better than I would have expected. Marco, not so much. He pressed his mouth into a tight line. Abruzzo isn't here? That he'd used her last name pissed me off. No matter how it looked, there was no way Frankie had anything to do with Enzo getting shot. She had an errand. I turned away from him, gave Iris a quick hug, and headed for the door. Phone in hand, I called Frankie's cell. No answer. Shit, where are you? I hopped into the back of a waiting SUV and nodded for the driver to go. There was no sense in waiting for Marco to catch up. Emergency protocols dictated we couldn't ride in the same vehicle or even enter the hospital through the same entrance. The Secret Service had nothing on Mafia security teams. Because of the number of Marchionis who'd shown up, or the fact that my family had donated millions to the medical school, we were corralled in a private room. While I appreciated the gesture, the main emergency department waiting area was probably more peaceful than a dozen or so scared and stressed out Italians. My mother paced back and forth, giving her rosary beads a workout. Between her wringing hands and her death grip on the thin chain, I feared it would snap. No big deal for the average American Catholic, but Evelyn Marchione had grown up in Sicily. She had more superstitions than a major league baseball team. A broken rosary would be a bad omen. A message from God that Enzo was doomed, and more unnecessary drama than any of us could handle. I stood and drew her into an embrace. He's going to be okay, Ma. Shivering against my chest, she whispered, do you recognize this room? This is the same room we learned Joe and Rebecca were gone. And it's Friday. They died on a Friday. Ma, you of all people know we have to have faith. I hadn't spent much time with her over the previous year. She'd done some rather underhanded things to keep me and my brothers in the mafia. Part of me had a difficult time forgiving her, but a bigger part understood why she'd done what she'd done. Going legit had, at least in part, led to our current situation. Prior to getting out of the Cosa Nostra, we'd all had security teams and protocols that kept us alive. Joe and Rebecca's assassination had been an anomaly, a wrong place at the wrong time, and the bad guy got lucky type situation. Two shootings in the same location within such a short time frame never would have happened. Enzo's team would have had him under lock and key until they knew he was safe. This sort of thing was no coincidence. It likely meant whoever had done this was determined very well paid, or both. My mom made the sign of the cross, kissed her index finger and drew a tiny cross on my mouth. From your lips to God's ears. Where's Shauna? She made no secret how she felt about Enzo's wife. Even standing in a hospital waiting room, with my brother fighting for his life, Evelyn Marchione made a sour face at the mention of the other woman's name. With Dahlia Calhoun? The girl was barely grazed. She's fine, but Shauna would rather coddle her friend than be with her husband's family. Can you blame her? Nodding, I released her and took a seat away from the others. I couldn't help but wonder how Ma would react if she knew about me and Frankie. Since we'd been old enough to notice girls, my mother had harped on us to marry Italians, Catholic Italians, preferably from the old country. While Frankie was those things, she was an Abruzzo, 
And to my mom, that was the same as being first cousins with Satan. I tried to reach Frankie again. The call went straight to voicemail. Weird, considering in the months I'd known her, she'd obsessed about keeping her cell charged so she could receive alerts from her software project and from her sisters. Software she'd developed for my family. How would I miss that little detail over the previous few months? We'd talked code more times than I could count. Listen to me, park in the grass. If you're towed, we'll deal with it. Just get your ass in here. Gabe spoke entirely too loud for the small space. Evidently, Leah was having a difficult time finding a parking spot due to an onslaught of reporters gathered outside. Freaking great. Of course the vultures are here. Marco shook his head. We should have expected the news coverage. Dahlia is the governor's daughter, and Enzo is a Marchioni. By Marchioni, I assumed he meant a suspected mobster. Has the woman at the restaurant been identified? With everything going on, I'd forgotten to ask. Marco's expression darkened. Harrison Merriweather's ex-wife, Dahlia and Shauna, were supposed to meet her for lunch. I could see the headlines. Popular politician kills ex-wife and injures ex-girlfriend. It was possible, but not freaking likely. Enzo had been close both times shots were fired. It made more sense he was the target, and the women happened to be in the way. Gabe hung up and motioned to me. Leo's coming in through the front. He's not alone. Not alone? It took me a couple seconds to catch on. Leo had brought his and Dahlia's son to the hospital. The son my mother had no idea existed. Shit, I pushed to my feet. I'll find him and bring him back. Gabe nodded and took the seat next to Evelyn. Hey, Ma, there's something you should know before Leo comes in here. Call it self-preservation or a low tolerance for drama, but I needed to get the heck out of there before Gabe spilled the beans about the kid. I hit the door and didn't look back. Once in the main waiting room, I dialed Frankie's number. She didn't pick up, but hearing her voice in the recording helped to calm my nerves. Hey, Frankie, it's Dante. Give me a call when you get this. It's important. I didn't expect her to reply until she'd had a chance to charge her phone. Leo burst into the room with a gunner in his arms. He glanced around like a man on the verge of a meltdown and headed for the reception desk. I waved to get his attention. Leo turned his anxiety-ridden gaze toward me and my mind went blank. I should have thought about what to say to him rather than calling Frankie. Instead, I panicked and told him what I hoped was the truth. They're both going to be okay. Thank Christ. His eyes softened and his voice quivered. Where is everyone? This way. I nodded to the nurse behind the desk. She pushed a security button and the double doors leading to the patient area whooshed open. Leo stared at the controlled chaos, otherwise known as the emergency department, and froze. I got it. The last time we'd stood in these halls was the night Joe and Rebecca had died. It was like voluntarily walking into your worst nightmare while wide awake. My nephew gave me a shy wave before burying his face in Leo's shoulder. The poor kid had no idea what was waiting for him. They have us in a private room. I led them down the hall to a less controlled kind of chaos. Our family. Everyone in the waiting room turned and stared when Leo walked inside. Our mom took one look at the toddler and whispered a prayer. Once again, Leo froze in his tracks. I need to see Dahlia. Mama is here? Gunner perked up. I see her? My heart broke for both of them. I couldn't begin to imagine how I'd feel if it were Frankie back there. Shauna walked into the room, stiff and stone face. Enzo's in surgery to remove the bullet. There doesn't appear to be any damage to his internal organs, but the docs will know more once they get in and look around. My mom pressed her hand to her chest. Leo rounded on Shauna. Do you know where Dahlia is? Can you take me to her? She nodded to Gunner. I stepped forward to help, but Leo didn't seem to notice. He whispered something to the little guy and started to hand him off to Gabe. Our mom had other ideas. Like a four-foot-nothing defensive end, she practically knocked Gabe off his feet to get to her grandson. I'll take him. The child stared at her for a heartbeat before taking Leo's face in his fat little hands and forcing his father to look at him. The little guy tried to whisper, but he ended up sounding more like Christian Bale playing Batman. Who is that? I'd never given much thought to having kids, but suddenly I wanted one who imitated superheroes and had my wild curls in Frankie's eyes. Maybe a girl, a tomboy who wears a pink cape and combat boots. I shook myself out of the daydream. Seeing firsthand how Leo was with his son and watching Gunner interact with my family made me realize I'd been wrong about my brother. Very wrong. When I'd first found out Leo had kept the child a secret, I'd been angry and hurt 
and couldn't wrap my brain around why he'd do such a thing. I'd called him selfish. In reality, he'd been the opposite. No wonder he's been such a miserable SOB for the past year. It must have killed him to keep his son away from the rest of us, or to be a part-time dad. He'd made a huge sacrifice to keep Gunnar and Dahlia safe from the Mafia. I doubted I'd have the balls to do the same. There's no way I'm letting Frankie walk away. My family will accept her or lose me. There's no other option. I loved her, and she loved me, and that was worth fighting for. Chapter 22, Dante. An hour or so had gone by and I'd felt each freaking second in slow motion. The longer Enzo's surgery went on, the more the tension in the room rose. No one spoke about it. No one had to. We'd all been there before with Joe. Even having Gunner in the room gave me an odd sense of deja vu. Joe and Rebecca's youngest son, Ryan, had been about the same age when his parents were killed. The older two had been with Rebecca's mother the night of the crash, but Ryan had been with my parents, which meant he'd come to the hospital with them. Unlike Ryan, Gunner would walk out of here with his mom and dad. Leo returned to the waiting room with the governor of Louisiana. Over the years, Waylon Calhoun, Dahlia's father, had made it known he didn't like my family or our type of people in his fine state. I couldn't imagine his daughter getting shot had done much to sway his opinion. The chief of police shared footage from one of the city security videos with Waylon. Leo glanced at each of us. Take a look and tell me if the woman in the video looks familiar. A woman? Sophia Abruzzo? Could she still be in New Orleans? I caught Marco staring and frowned. Leo handed the phone to Gabe. He watched the screen, shook his head, and handed the cell to Marco. Gabe might have played it off, but his jaw had tightened hard enough to crack his back teeth. Marco took the phone, frowned, and showed the video to Nico. I knew I was in trouble when she handed it to me. Brow wrinkled and eyes misted. Nico mouthed, I'm sorry. I took one look at the face on the screen and my entire world exploded. I could hardly breathe, let alone think straight. Fuck, Frankie, what the hell? Forcing myself to keep my expression blank, I swallowed hard to keep from vomiting. I don't know her. Leo glared. He caught my reaction. I only hoped Waylon Calhoun hadn't. What the hell is Leo playing at? He has to recognize her. I needed to get the hell out of there and find Frankie. There had to be an explanation. A reason she was at the scene of the shooting. A reason she'd reached into her freaking pocket right before the gun went off. A reason Abruzzo's goons were walking a few feet in front of her. There's only one reason. She shot Enzo. My mother glanced at the screen and sighed. This woman shot my son? She might have played it cool, but she'd recognize the youngest Abruzzo's sister. We don't know yet, Ma. Maybe nothing. Leo took the cell from her and handed it back to the governor. Thank you. It was worth a try. Let's hope the police have better luck. He glanced around the room, seemingly unconvinced. The police? Did Marco tell anyone else Frankie's staying with me? His security team knows. So did Kincaid and his men. Will he call them? Have her apprehended? Then what? I ran my trembling hand over my face and my fingers came away wet. This couldn't be happening. I loved her. There was so much stacked against us from day one, but this? There was no coming back from something like this. Did she fucking play me all along? Calhoun slid the phone into his pocket, walked to where Gunner was playing and kissed his cheek. I'll see you soon, squirt. See you, granddaddy. Gunner turned and wrapped his arms around the governor's legs. Nausea rolled through me like a tsunami. Did Frankie do this? Did she almost rob this child of his mom? Shauna and Leo of the loves of their lives? The longer I sat in the room with them, the angrier I became. But I couldn't decide if I was more pissed at Frankie or myself. I'd allowed her into my life, given her access to the tools she'd needed to pull this off. I hated myself for loving her. Or maybe I was furious at Marco for not fighting harder to get away from the mafia. Or my mother for the way she treated her daughters-in-law. Or my father for getting sick and not being there when we needed him. Or my brothers for finding the right women and stopping at nothing to be with them. Calhoun knelt in front of the child. Your mama isn't feeling well. You're going to have to be extra good for her, you hear? 
Nodding, Gunner put his hands on his chest with his elbows sticking out like wings. I good? Right, Daddy? Right, Gunner. You're the best. Calhoun smiled. There's no mistake and he's yours. My mother muttered under her breath in Italian, but for once in her life, she kept her opinions to herself. Leo squared his shoulders. You should know. I plan to seek legal paternity. And Dahlia, do you plan to marry her? Calhoun's smile remained in place, a skill he'd undoubtedly picked up on the campaign trail. As soon as I can convince her to say yes, Leo said. My family whispered amongst themselves, but like Gunner, they'd never mastered the art of speaking in hushed tones. They knew how to shout, speak loudly, or mutter, but not whisper. No one, not even my mother, had a negative thing to say about Leo's proclamation. Then again, Dolly had been around for almost a decade. We'd all wondered why Leo hadn't made a move. I'd wish you good luck, but I doubt you'll need it. The governor clamped a hand on my brother's shoulder. Can I talk to you alone for a moment? Sure. Leo followed him out of the room. I wasn't the jealous type, but in that moment, I saw green. I'd played it safe. Kept my dick in my pants most of the time. Didn't do one-nighters. Waited for the right woman to come along before getting serious. I'd done everything right, and every fucking thing had turned out wrong. As soon as the door closed, my mother shot to her feet. Will someone tell me what Francesca Abruzzo was doing in New Orleans? Shauna pressed her hand to her belly. Until that moment, I'd forgotten about Marco telling me she was pregnant. Francesca? Not Sophia? They're sisters. Marco kept his tone soft, but I doubted anything could lessen the impact of the news. She sank into the chair beside Maggie, Gabe's wife, and dipped her chin. I hadn't seen her cry since I'd arrived at the hospital. But the news that an Abruzzo might have had something to do with the shooting brought tears to her eyes. She's reacting to the last name. She doesn't know Frankie. Do I know her? Really know her? Had Frankie shot Enzo? It didn't make sense. Or did it? She'd certainly asked a lot of questions about him. The night of the Christmas party, Enzo had said Frankie was following him around. Had she been hoping to get a shot at him? Had she sent me to get wine we'd never carried to get rid of me? Had I interrupted her before she could kill Enzo? And then there was Abruzzo's plane landing and my missing alert. Had she deleted it to cover Tommaso's tracks? Leo returned to the room, glanced around, and sucked in a breath. What did I miss? Is Enzo out of surgery? Not yet. Leo, about the woman in the video. Shauna glanced around the room, likely hoping someone would finish her sentence. He sighed and shifted his weight from one foot to the other, likely in a hurry to get back to Dahlia. I thought it was Julia Carpenter, but I wasn't sure. Why didn't anyone confirm it outright? Marco shot me a warning look. The problem was, I had no clue what he was warning me about. Nico muttered something or another in Italian. Gabe folded his arms. She may be going by the name Julia Carpenter, but that's Francesca Abruzzo. No, that's ridiculous. She worked for us for months. How is it no one recognized her? Leo glared at me. How did you not know this? I couldn't look at him, let alone answer. What would a mob princess want with a former Mrs. Merriweather? No one had an answer for him, at least not one they said out loud. Knowing that Harris and Merriweather's ex-wife and Dahlia were in the wrong place at the wrong time wouldn't help Leo. Frankie was sent to boarding school in Connecticut when she was 14. Nico sighed as if she carried the weight of the world on her shoulders. She's my cousin but she looks a lot different now. Leo gripped the back of the nearest chair. Is she like Sophia? I couldn't take it another minute. Part of me refused to believe she was behind this, but the sane part recognized there were too many unanswered questions. Too many odd coincidences. And all of those wheeze. How did I not see it? Fuck. She was working with Sophia this entire time. A sledgehammer to the skull wouldn't have hurt as much as my realization. Frankie had all but told me she was living with Sophia, and I'd, what, missed it? Blown it off? Willfully ignored it, or looked at her as a victim for having a psycho for a sister? I'd forgiven her everything. The lies, the espionage, the manipulation. I'd let it all go because I loved her. But she'd played me all along. There was no way the woman I thought I knew would live with a cold-blooded killer. 
The rotten fucking apple couldn't have fallen that far from the murder tree. They have to be working together. My mother said, Frankie was sheltered from the life. As far as I know, she hasn't been back to Sicily since she was a girl. That's not good enough. I need to know what the hell she's up to. She lied to us to get the job. Is it that far of a stretch she's following in her big sister's footsteps? Leo glared at Marco. You're the capo. Make the call. Find her and bring her to the house. I opened my mouth to tell them what I knew about Frankie, but Marco cut me off. You worry about Dahlia and your son, and let me worry about the business. Leo balled his hands. This is my business, if she shot Dahlia and Enzo. Mommy got a shot? Gunner's voice rose high and shrill. My mother narrowed her eyes at my brothers before turning to the boy. The doctors are taking good care of her. She got a shot? He pressed his hands to her cheeks and forced her to look at him. I don't think so, but we'll ask her when she's all done. I want mama. He let out a cry that would have made banshees jealous. Glaring at Marco, Leo crossed the room and picked up the boy. No. He kicked and struggled to break free. Nani, hold me. My mother pulled the frightened child from Leo and murmured to him in Italian. This isn't over, Leo pointed at Marco. If you won't track Frankie down, I will. Don't step on my toes, big brother. I'm not going to warn you again. Basta, stop it. You're upsetting the baby. Ma hissed, rocked Gunner and gave them what we used to call the evil eye. Shio. I'd heard enough, and my mother shooing them out of the room gave me the perfect opportunity to slip out. I stood and inched my way to the door. I had to find Francesca Abruzzo before she left the city if I'm not already too late. Leo said, you heard her, let's go outside. My pleasure, Marco marched past him. Leo rounded on me, where are you going? To get coffee while well, you two jackasses give the reporters outside a show. I walked out and went in the opposite direction as the two morons. Unfortunately, Shauna caught up to me before I could escape. Dante, wait. That I had to force myself to look her in the eye hit me like a battering ram. I might not have pulled the trigger, but I was at least partially to blame. I didn't want to ask in front of your mom, but would you mind picking up some crackers and ginger ale while you're in the cafeteria? She rubbed her non-existent baby bump. I think the stress has brought on my morning sickness. I pulled her into a tight embrace to keep her from seeing the guilt in my eyes. I'm so sorry. I'm not going to rest until I find out who did this. Chapter 23, Frankie. I needed cover or concealment or a freaking place to hide. What I had was a panicked crowd, tightly packed buildings, and half the freaking New Orleans police force. My only hope of getting out of the quarter was to keep my wits and stay in large groups of people. Running quicker than the tourists would have drawn attention. Ducking into a store or hotel could work, but I'd be trapped inside. Since I had no idea where the Sicilians were, I didn't dare stop moving. I glanced up and recognized one of the shops. I was on Royal Street. Lucky for me, it was one of the busier areas this time of year. Keeping my chin down, I slipped out of Dante's hoodie. Pasquale and his buddy would be looking for a woman in gray fleece, not a black cotton t-shirt. I was terrified they were following, but I knew better than to look over my shoulder. One it would slow me down, and two, a face was far easier to recognize than the back of a head. I crossed St. Louis Street and sent up a prayer of thanks when the looming white marble of the Louisiana Supreme Court building came into view. Several groups of police officers stood on the stairs leading to the entrance. Not an uncommon sight, considering the station was next door. But there seemed to be more uniformed men milling about than usual. Two shootings in two hours? No wonder they're on alert. Forcing myself to walk at a normal speed, I split from the crowd and made my way inside the courthouse and into a security checkpoint. Crap. The officer manning the metal detector and x-ray machine nodded toward a long, thin table. This way, miss, I'll need to check your bag. Sure. I glanced over my shoulder 
half expecting Pasquale and his accomplice to burst through the door with guns blazing. Miss, the officer held his hand out for my purse. Everything okay? Sorry, I think I'm in a state of shock. There was a shooting on charters. I set my bag on the table, dropped my dead cell into the bowl, and walked through the metal detector. I heard, he rummaged through my purse. But rather than handing it back to me, he stared. Did you see what happened? No, I heard the shots, and then people started running, so I ran too. I rubbed my upper arms as if to warm myself. Lost my jacket in the process. This city is going to the dogs. Shaking his head, he handed me my phone and bag. Is there a ladies room nearby? Second floor to the left of the stairs. I gave him a quick nod and followed his directions to the restroom. Once inside, I splashed water on my face and did my best to calm down. Easier said than done. A woman dressed in a navy blue power suit walked into the ladies room. She gave me a polite smile and washed her hands. Excuse me, I pulled myself from my bag. My phone died. Would you mind if I borrowed yours? It won't take long. She stared from my beat up sneakers to the oversized t-shirt I'd borrowed from Dante to my uncombed hair. I looked an absolute mess. I just hoped it worked in my favor. Please, it's important. I can't even use an office phone because I need to sign into my cloud to retrieve a number. Sure. She handed me her pale purple iPhone and hitched her thumb toward a stall. I'll be in there. Thank you. I never would have handed a stranger something so valuable and then went pee. I mean, I could have made a break for it. What's happened to me? When did I become so damned cynical? With Sophia missing, I didn't know who to call. Unlike Dante, I didn't have a close family or family close by. I didn't have brothers or sisters-in-law or nieces and nephews or two loving parents. I barely knew my siblings, except Sophia, and she wasn't exactly the drop everything and help out type. I envied the Marchionis. And then I remembered an email I'd received from Marco. He was probably with Dante and the others, but Marco was the capo. He'd been in the position long enough to have developed the all-important mafia survival skill of swallowing one's emotions until the crisis had passed. Besides. As the head of a crime family, he had a certain obligation to see to my safety. As the daughter of another crime boss, I was kind of like a visiting dignitary. As such, I should have been able to look at Marco like a consulate or embassy. Should have, because I'd entered his territory illegally. Not to mention I'd participated in less than upfront and honest activities since I'd arrived. What choice do I have? It's not like I can stay in this bathroom forever. I opened a browser window, signed into my account, and clicked on the number he'd included in the message. Marchioni. Marco's tone had me second guessing my decision to call him. This is Frankie Abruzzo. I'm in serious trouble. He wasted no time with small talk. Where are you? The bathroom in the courthouse on Royal Street. I'm on a borrowed phone. I drew a quick breath to steady my nerves. Pasquale Pulisi and another of my brother's men. Is that something to do with the shooting? Yes, my AI program's facial recognition software placed him at the first shooting. And I saw them on the sidewalk. The woman in the power suit gasped from inside her stall. But I'd have to deal with her after I'd convinced Marco to help me. Marco hissed a series of curses that made me thankful I wasn't face to face with him. The reality of what had happened, what I'd witnessed, stole my breath. I tried to warn Enzo, but I was too late. What were you doing there? His voice practically dripped with accusation. I was under the impression you were on lockdown at Dante's. I would never hurt. I didn't have anything to do with this. Did Pulisi see you? His lack of reaction didn't surprise me. But I would have loved a little reassurance right about then. Yes, I managed to get away, but they may have followed me. Enzo, is he? My voice cracked. In surgery, 
but the ducks think he'll make it. And Leo's friend, Dahlia? A couple of stitches. They're releasing her soon. His voice softened. I take it you need me to get you out of the courthouse? Please, I didn't want to put Dante in danger, or any of you, but I- It's okay. Thanks for not calling my brother. He's not exactly thinking straight. Hold on a second. Marco had a brief and muffled conversation with someone else. Which entrance did you use? Charters or Royal? I came in from Royal Street. I'm in the second floor ladies room. Stay put. Do not leave the bathroom until my guy knocks with your alias. Marco sighed. You should know the police will be looking for you soon, if they aren't already. Nausea rolled through me, and spots danced before my eyes. Why? Security cameras caught you running toward Enzo with your hand in your pocket right before the shots were fired. I didn't do it, Marco. I swear on my mother's life, I didn't. My voice rose to the point the woman in the stall gasped. I'd all but forgotten she was there. After overhearing my half of the conversation, she was probably ready to forget her expensive phone and bolt for the door. You understand why I can't take you at your word just yet? Yes, I did. I really did. I wouldn't have trusted me either. No amount of explaining would make Marco believe me. I could only hope that he'd trust me one day. Does Dante think I? We'll talk about this later. Imagining what Dante must think of me broke my heart. He needed to focus on Enzo and Dahlia, not me and my crazy family. I wouldn't put him in that kind of situation again, no matter how bad it hurt. I had to walk away from him. I'm putting you on a plane out of New Orleans tonight. I have a safe house somewhere Tommaso will never find you. He spoke as if discussing facts. No anger or threats or questions. In Marco's mind, I would follow his orders, period. You don't have to do that. I've had an escape plan in place since the day I arrived in New Orleans. I just need you to get me out of the city. I'll take it from there. This isn't a request, Frankie. I need to know where you are until I get to the bottom of what happened today. Don't even think about running. If you do, I'll assume you're guilty and act accordingly. I understand. If I were him, I'd want to keep tabs on me too. But that didn't make the idea of being shipped off to who knows where any less frightening. From one prison to another to another, the story of my life. Listen, if what you said was true, you know too much. Don't think for a second Tommaso won't order you eliminated to stop you from pinning the shooting on him. When I was a little girl, my Nona used to have petite mal seizures. Rather than her body shaking, she would disappear inside herself. One minute, she'd be smiling and talking, and the next, she would stare into space. I was pretty sure I had one of those in the middle of my conversation with Marco. My brain seized like an overheated motherboard, and my internal monitor stuck on one image. Tommaso executing me for knowing too much. Frankie, I snapped back to reality. I'm here, sorry. Marco's tone softened. I'll let Dante know where you are. No, don't. It's best if he... No, I'll go alone. I let out a sob before I could stop myself and disconnected the call. The woman whose phone I'd borrowed poked her head out of the stall. Excuse me, I couldn't help but overhear that. Are you all right? Yep, sorry. Some family trouble is all. I handed her cell phone back to her. Thank you. That sounded like more than a domestic situation. She straightened her jacket. I'm Samantha Jenkins. I work for the district attorney. I can help you. The last thing I needed was her thinking she was helping by alerting the police. Now that I'm wanted for questioning in an attempted murder, I'll be fine. I just said the right thing but she'd slowly started to angle herself toward the exit. That was a friend. He's sending people to get me out of here. My brother, he's obsessed. All the more reason to alert the authorities. She took a step toward the door. Wait, 
If I didn't think of something, and fast, I'd end up in jail instead of on a plane. I remembered what Dante had said about the way people in New Orleans reacted to the Marchione name. Drawing on my informal education as a mafia princess, I squared my shoulders, raised my chin, and said, I know I look an absolute mess, but believe me, my future in-laws will not appreciate the press coverage involving the police will bring. The woman pursed her lips and gave me a look that told me she wasn't buying my bullshit. Surely your future in-laws would want you safe. The Marchionis are very private people. Her eyes widened. The Marchionis? I can give you the number to the mansion if you'd like to speak to the head of security. Playing up the ruse, I held out my hand for her phone and added a veiled threat for good measure. I'll let them know that Samantha Jenkins from the district attorney's office would like to speak to them. No, that's quite all right. She hurried out so fast, I worried she'd break a heel. Dante was right. Chapter 24 Dante. I had one goal, find Frankie Abruzzo and find out what the hell was going on. Simple enough, considering I knew where she worked and where she slept. However, I greatly underestimated how complicated my life had become since the woman of my dreams turned out to be an Abruzzo. Kincaid met me the second I walked through the doors of Marchione Corporation. Sir, we have a problem. I didn't have time for the head of security and his problems, not when they interfered with my freaking mission. Just one? Several, in fact. He trailed behind me. Under any circumstances, I would have found a large man struggling to keep up with me funny, but I wasn't in the mood for humor. I stopped moving long enough to press the up button on the elevator. Sir, I need you to listen to what I have to say before you- Kincaid grabbed my upper arm when I turned for the stairs. Enter your apartment. Kincaid had worked for my family for as long as I could remember, but never, not once, had he touched me, let alone physically restrained me. I glared from his hand on my arm to his eyes. Talk. The police were upstairs to question you about the shooting. I could barely hear him over the buzzing in my ears. Where's Miss Carpenter? Kincaid flashed me a smirk that tap danced on the line between rude and outright insubordination. Miss Abruzzo hasn't been seen since she left the penthouse this morning. The news she hadn't returned hit me like a bullet to the heart. There were two explanations as to why she disappeared. One, she had something to do with the shooting. Or two, Tommaso had found her. Right, Abruzzo. I wasn't aware you'd been briefed in the situation. It's my job to know what's going on inside this building. A job you've made more difficult by keeping secrets. He folded his arms. Once again, I was struck with another first from King Cade. He'd freaking called me out on my personal life, or at least come damned close to doing so. You work for me, remember? He stiffened his spine. I work for this company, and it's run by a board of directors. If anything, I answer to Gabe, not you. That isn't a technicality you want to exploit right now, King Cade. I'd had enough of the time suck and the conversation. Tell me whatever the hell you need to tell me or get out of my way. The detectives upstairs are here to question you about Francesca Abruzzo's possible involvement in Enzo's shooting. They have been with Iris Rogers for a solid hour. What the? Who let them upstairs and why were they left alone with Iris? As soon as this business with Frankie ended, I intended to see Kincaid's head on a human resources platter. Under no circumstances should he or anyone else have let law enforcement into my apartment without a search warrant, let alone left them unattended. Miss Rogers called them, sir. He turned and strode away. You have got to be kidding me. I stepped into the elevator and stabbed the button for my floor. For the life of me, I couldn't understand why mousy little Iris would have called the freaking police. Last time I'd checked, she and Frankie were close. A uniformed officer and two men in cheap sports coats stood when I entered my front door. One of the men, who I assumed were detectives, smiled. The other stared as if he caught a whiff of something foul. Gentlemen, I had nothing against the police, but I couldn't say the same for them about me. My limited experience with the New Orleans Police Department had taught me most of them knew, or knew of, my family. And they didn't want us in their city a fact made quite clear by the way we had been treated after Joe and Rebecca were murdered. Detective Turd under his nose said, Dante Marchione, that's me. 
I glanced around the room and found Iris curled up in the corner of my couch. Her red eyes and running nose told me she'd been crying, but her refusal to meet my gaze made it difficult for me to give a shit. We're following up on two related tips regarding your brother's shooting. This from Detective Smiley. Miss Rogers recognized a person of interest from a news story and called the hotline. News story? Had the police released the video of Frankie? I see. I folded my arms. What was the second tip? This woman is wanted for questioning. The officer in blue gave me an 8x10 glossy. A witness came forward claiming she had a conversation with the woman in the photo, during which the person of interest said she was engaged to a Marchione. Do you recognize her? Staring at the grainy image of Frankie, I asked, what does she have to do with my brother's shooting? That's what we're trying to find out. We understand her name is Frankie Abruzzo, but she goes by the alias Julia Carpenter? I shoved the photo back into his hands. That's correct. Do you know where Miss Abruzzo is now? No clue. Rather than seeming combatant or evasive, I went for the sympathy card, even though I doubted it would do any good. I've been at the hospital with my brother's pregnant wife. I came home to change clothes and grab some food before heading back out. But Miss Abruzzo is currently living with you? The detective with a sour expression gave me a once over. She's staying here with Iris temporarily. I'm in the penthouse. I pointed to the ceiling just in case they didn't know where it was. I'm in a hurry to get back before my brother is out of surgery. If there's nothing else, I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to leave. Detective Smiley stopped smiling. That's quite the setup you have in your office. What exactly is it you do for a living, Mr. Marchione? It took every ounce of my willpower to keep from turning to Iris. What the hell had she been thinking, allowing the police to go through my home? Reminding myself she was a civilian, not affiliated with the mafia, I leaped to the likely conclusion she'd agreed when the nice officers had asked to take a look around. I shrugged. Nothing, really. My folks own the building and the company. I mostly play video games and watch YouTube. Now, shall I ask my attorney to join us, or will you be leaving? They exchanged glances, and boy, oh boy, did they look like someone had taken a dump in their box of donuts. I pulled my phone from my pocket. He's down on the second floor, an elevator ride away. Detective not so smiley gave me his card on his way to the door. Call us if Miss Abruzzo shows up. Will do. I gave them a half-hearted and totally smart-ass salute and closed the door behind them. I'm so sorry. I didn't know they thought Frankie was the killer. Iris shot to her feet. I've been trying to get a hold of her all day. I saw her picture on the television and thought... There I was, standing in front of the only friend of Frankie's that I knew of, and Iris was what? Thinking Frankie had pulled the trigger? You think she did this? No, never. I thought she might have been hurt, or maybe the men who kidnapped me had her. Dante, you asshole. Cursing myself, I drew the weeping woman into an embrace. It's okay. No harm, no foul, right? I invited them in, and they started looking around. I didn't know what to do. She wiped her snot on the back of her hand. Can they do that? I mean, is it legal for them to just go through your stuff like that? They're investigating a high-profile murder and two high-profile attempted murders. They're not going to follow all of the rules. I didn't have the heart to tell her how badly she'd screwed Frankie over. Now that they had a positive ID on Frankie, it wouldn't take much digging for the police to turn up information on the Abruzzos and my father's accusations that Sophia had killed my brother and sister-in-law. Given the right details in the wrong context, Frankie using a fake name made her look almost as guilty as her showing up holding the murder weapon. You don't think she did those things, do you? Iris wrapped her arms around herself. I have no idea what I think, sweetheart. No, I don't. But I need to find out why she was at the scene when Enzo was shot. I walked down the hall to check the back cave. I didn't make a habit of leaving questionable material on my desk, but I wanted to be sure nothing had been disturbed. Iris followed me. I didn't either, but then the men who rescued me from her house came and searched her personal things. The room tilted, and I gripped the edge of the desk to steady my balance. Marco's security team was here? When? I hadn't meant to shout, but I seemed to have lost control of my body. Hands trembling and lungs struggling to function, I turned to Iris. Did they take anything? She backed away from me. Some clothes, and they asked me if I knew where she kept her passport. 
Rather than continuing to bark at an innocent woman, I pulled out my phone and called my guiltiest sin brother. Since Marco's men had Frankie's passport, I had a sneaking suspicion where he'd taken her. The call went straight to voicemail, and so did Nico's. I tried Marco several more times before leaving a voicemail. I know you have Frankie. Don't let her leave the country until I get there. Shoving my cell in my pocket, I headed for the airport. Chapter 25, Frankie. I watched the city go by from behind dark tinted glass and tried not to think about Dante. Easier said than done. He had to be hurting. Two of Marco's team had shown up shortly after the concerned citizen had left me alone in the bathroom. They'd gotten me out of the building, into the waiting SUV, and on my way to the airport without incident. Lucky me. Unfortunately, they'd treated me like a prisoner of war and had taken my dead cell phone, purse, and all of my cash. Thankfully, they hadn't found the DNA results when they'd frisked me for weapons. The report was still tucked safely in my pocket. Marco and Nicolina stepped out of their vehicle the second my SUV came to a stop on the tarmac. I climbed out and huddled deeper in the gigantic jacket one of the guards had given me. As if choreographed, the couple turned to me and widened their eyes. However, that's where the similarities ended. Nico stared as if she didn't quite know what to say. Marco, on the other hand, cracked a grin that reminded me far too much of the man I was desperately trying to forget. Any problems? Marco folded his arms. None. Your team are professionals. I slid the coat from my shoulders and handed it back to its owner. I'm ready when the pilot is. Marco arched an eyebrow. I recognize that shirt. Do you not have any clothes of your own? Don't tease her. My cousin elbowed her husband's side before flashing me what appeared to be a genuine smile. Frankie, I wish it were under better circumstances, but it's good to see you again. I'm not sure what I'd expected from the two of them, but it wasn't warmth and kindness. You too. I think I was five or six the last time your nanny brought you to visit my sisters and I. Marco nodded to the plane. Let's continue this conversation on board. Sure, my chest tightened. Despite their easygoing manner, I doubted they'd stopped by to catch up with a long lost cousin. He led us up the rolling stairs and into the main cabin of the Marchioni jet. The blonde flight attendant smiled and batted her lashes at Marco while ignoring Nico and me. Welcome aboard, Mr. Marchioni. Can I get you something to drink? My wife and I aren't staying. Miss Smith is traveling alone. Marco barely spared her a glance, but his message came across loud and clear. He wasn't interested, and Nico deserved respect. But we would like some privacy. She turned the approximate shade of a cherry tomato and excused herself from the cabin. Seating himself on a cream-colored leather sofa, Marco eyed me with an expression somewhere between perplexed and annoyed. We need to talk. Nico settled beside him and gave him an amused look. What my gruff husband means is we aren't here to grill you. We have a couple of questions and we'll be on our way. Her Sicilian accent hit me in the solar plexus. It reminded me of my family and home and all of the ways I'd failed my sisters. What would you like to know? I sank into a chair and forced myself to relax, or tried to. I didn't quite trust their good cop, bad cop routine. Nico turned to me. First off, are you all right? I debated how to answer honestly. I guess as well as can be expected. May I ask where you're sending me? Trapani, Marco said. That singular word left me gasping for breath. I can't go back to Sicily. You'll only be in Trapani long enough to get from the plane to the harbor. My brother, Giancarlo, will escort you to the safe house on Alicudi. Nico glanced between us. Please feel free to make yourself at home in the villa. I have clothes there. Help yourself to anything you need. 
thanks. I don't suppose there are phones or computers in the villa. For now, it's best you don't have contact with the outside world. She lowered her gaze as if embarrassed by the answer. I know the drill. Knowing it and liking it were two entirely different things. Still, I counted myself lucky to be alive. Marco clasped his hands. Dante filled me in on what you do at Marchioni Corporation, and what you had hoped to gain from working there. But I'd like to hear it from you. Straight and to the point, I liked him. Except for the whole shipping me off to an undisclosed location and keeping me prisoner until he decided if I'd tried to kill his brother. I looked him in the eye and told him the truth. Originally, I hoped to find proof your family was continuing your illegal operations apart from the Cosa Nostra. I'd hoped to blackmail you into helping me and my sisters. Nico frowned. He nodded, but neither spoke. After several months, it became clear to me there was nothing to find. Nico tilted her head. Why did you stay? I hitched a shoulder. I liked the work I was doing there, and my access to Dante's software allowed me to keep tabs on Tommaso. Marco drew a slow breath. How did Sophia fit into this? After our father died, we fled Sicily together and ended up here. By accepting his help, I'd put my life in his hands. There was no sense in lying to him. Sophia was convinced Enzo was our half-brother and rightful heir to the Abruzzo throne. He glanced at his wife, then back to me. Have you gotten the DNA results back yet? The walls around me pressed in, and it felt like he'd sucked all of the oxygen from the room. How did you know? Enzo mentioned missing bloody bandages. Is it true? Is he an Abruzzo? I nodded. Marco sat back and dragged his hand over his face. Christ. Nico fidgeted with her hands. We became suspicious when my father ordered me to marry Enzo, but claimed I'd married my brother after Marco and I eloped. He laced his fingers with hers. Lazio was convinced Nico's mother had an affair with my father, which would have made Nico have siblings with me and my brothers, except Enzo. After Lazio made his accusations, Sophia put two and two together. Our father died before she could confront him, but our mother confirmed he'd had an affair. I'd never stopped to wonder if any of the Marchionis had come to the same conclusion. Nico winced the moment I mentioned my sister. Understandable, considering the Marchionis believed she was responsible for Joe's death. But I had the feeling there was more to it. Marco squeezed her hand, as if to signal for her to keep quiet. Would you consider leaving Enzo out of this if I agree to help you and your sisters? What can you do? Tommaso is forcing Valentina to marry Michele Salvo. The union will split the Fratellanza in half. Given his marriage to my cousin, I assumed the Lazios would side with him. That left the Ricci's as the tiebreaker, and I had no idea which way they would vote. Tommaso has stepped on more than a few toes. He's also disobeyed the Fratellanza's order, forbidding your family from coming to New Orleans. Marco gave me a pointed stare. A stare that let me know in no uncertain terms how he felt about my brother. My throat went dry. Sophia and I did the same thing. As far as I'm concerned, you were here seeking protection. He stretched his arms across the back of the sofa and grinned. We offered you sanctuary and a job. A chance to start a new life apart from the Cosa Nostra. I didn't miss his emphasis on the word you. And Sophia? He shook his head. I can't help her. Nico sighed. My father tricked her into trying to poison the Marchionis. But her involvement in Joe's murder. I wanted to argue to set the record straight, to tell them Tommaso had ordered the hit, that the wrong Marchioni brother had gotten into the rigged vehicle. However, it wouldn't do any good. I needed proof, and despite my best efforts, I hadn't found any. Will you forget about the DNA test? Marco leaned forward again. If not for Dante's sake, for my father's. He's a dying man. 
Does he need to go to his grave knowing his wife was unfaithful? That his son wasn't his blood? Nicolina folded her arms and looked away. I didn't know her, but I had the feeling she knew something. Something Marco wasn't telling me. You're asking me to choose your family over my sister's? I'm asking you to do the right thing. Enzo could have been killed today. We don't know what sort of recovery he's facing. He stood and strode to the bar. And you are running out of time. Tommaso has Sofia. Nico shot her husband a sorry, not sorry look. I couldn't take any more surprises. My battered heart limped along as it was. But Nico's words threatened to stop it altogether. Did you get word from Sicily? Is she okay? Marco knocked back his scotch. I haven't been able to get confirmation on her condition since Tommaso put her on the plane. How do you know he has her? I scoured the feeds, but could never find the footage of that night. I knew the answer. Deep in my gut, I knew. But I needed to hear him say it. Dante has the recording. Marco looked at me as if I were a poor, stupid child. He kept it from you because he worried you to do something foolish. I nodded silently, but screamed on the inside. Dante knew how concerned I was that Sophia hadn't answered my calls. He knew I was scared to death something had happened to her, and he'd let me suffer? Why, because he thought I'd what? Storm my family's compound with guns blazing? Nico moved to the seat beside me and rested her hand on mine. Frankie. It was wrong of him to keep it from you, but Dante's heart was in the right place. It doesn't matter. I'm a big girl, I'll get over it. I folded my arms. As for the DNA results, I need time to consider my options. Nico lowered her voice. You and I both know Sophia won't go through with a wedding. Marco glanced out the window, nodded to someone on the tarmac, and turned back to me. Think about it. Make your decision, but don't take too long. It's only a matter of time before Tommaso realizes she's of no use to him and puts a bullet in her head. Nico gasped. Me? I sat, staring straight forward, trying desperately to figure out how I'd gone from waking in Dante's arms to this. Chapter 26, Dante. The trip to the airport was taking four freaking ever. Rather than berating the chauffeur for driving like my 100-year-old grandmother, I checked in with my mom. Dante, where in the world did you go? Her sharp voice took me off guard. As far as I knew, she hadn't left the hospital. Then again, when did my mother ever let a little thing like being in public get in the way of scolding one of her children? I'm looking for leads on the shooter. How's Enzo? In recovery. The doctors say he's going to need to take it easy for a little while, but he'll be home before Christmas. She whispered a little prayer and made a kissing sound, likely sending her gratitude to the big guy. As for the shooter, Leah was convinced it has something to do with that Senator Merriweather character. But you don't think so, do you? If only it were that simple. A crazy politician attempting to knock off his ex-wife and ex-girlfriend in one day. Okay, maybe that wouldn't be simple for Leah, but it sure as hell would take the pressure off me. I'm not sure, Ma. Her voice lowered to a hiss that reminded me of standing in corners, groundings, and beating with wooden spoons. What's going on between you and Francesca Abruzzo? I should have expected the question. Debated the appropriate response, drafted a statement, but I didn't. Instead, I told the truth. I'm in love with her, but it's over. It took a lot to stun my mother into silence, and by a lot, I meant her learning her youngest son was head over heels for the woman who might or might not have tried to kill her other son. After what felt like forever, she drew a deep breath. I've learned my lesson. It only took having this conversation with five sons, but I've learned. I had no idea what she was talking about. Okay. You could do worse than little Frankie Abruzzo. She's Italian, Catholic, and understands our business. I couldn't believe my ears. She'd absolutely hated my sisters-in-law while they were dating my brothers. Hell, she still couldn't stand Shauna. How can you say that, Ma? Regardless of who pulled the trigger, she's been hiding Sophia in New Orleans for a year. 
And you're telling me you wouldn't hide Marco if he were in trouble? What kind of alternate universe did I stumble into? So let me get this straight. You're okay with me being with Frankie because she's an Italian Catholic, even though she might be a murderer? Evelyn laughed. Don't put the noose around her neck until you know the facts. Right, of course not. I pinched the bridge of my nose. But you are too young to think about marriage. And for the love of everything good and holy, keep your cannoli in your pants. I found myself somewhere between shocked, disgusted, and amused. Sure thing, Ma. And on that note, I need to go. I'll let you know what the plans are for Christmas if Enzo can't travel. Thanks, love you. I hung up and dialed Marco, again. Marco answered on the first ring. I'm a little busy, what's up? He has the nerve to ask me that? Enzo was shot and he'd gone radio silent. Rather than explaining idiocy to an idiot, I went with Blunt. Where the hell is Frankie? She's safe, or as safe as I can make her, but I need your help. I love my brother, and while my mother would say it was a sin to favor one over the others, Marco was by far my favorite but I wanted to reach through the phone and punch him in the face. Where is she? On a plane. Screw reaching through the phone. I'm going to drive over there and beat his ass. To where? Frankie asked me not to tell you where she's headed. She's worried you'll do something stupid. He sighed. Kind of like reverse deja vu, isn't it? You didn't tell her about Sophia because you- Yeah, yeah, point taken. Did she do this? Was she the shooter? I don't know but I'm keeping her safe until I figure it out, which is where you come in. I could all but hear him rubbing his hands together like the evil genius he was not. I'm not helping you do anything until you tell me where you sent her. Do some digging into Harrison Merriweather and a Robert Becker. Find something that pins one or both shootings on them. We need to get your girl off the hook without the media getting wind of her mafia connections. You're talking about framing innocent people. My chest tightened. Marco and I had been inseparable growing up. Sure, we'd drifted apart since he jumped into the deep end of the mafia cesspool, but the guy I knew would never ask such a thing. Look, we don't know what we don't know, and I need to figure this out. I'm listening. Meriwether had good reason to want to off his ex-wife. Had she gone to the media with proof he'd beaten the shit out of her on a regular basis while they were married, his career would be over. I nodded to myself. I get it. He's a sleazebag that deserves whatever he gets. What about the other one? Becker works for Governor Calhoun. Dahlia placed him at Enzo's moments before the gun went off. Marco drew a deep breath. Andy planted a bomb in Leo's car tonight at the hospital. He's hardly innocent. Are Leo and Gunner? They're safe. He lowered his voice. As for your woman, she's not my woman. Keep telling yourself that. He laughed. As for Frankie, I put her on a plane to Trapani. Giancarlo was meeting her. From there, he'll take her to the safe house on Alicuri. Of all the places in the world he could have sent her, he'd chosen Tommaso's backyard? Are you freaking nuts? In what universe was sending her anywhere near Sicily a good idea? You're going to have to trust me on this one. I know what I'm doing. I concede he knew more about mob politics than I did, but I knew Frankie. She had to be freaking out. Panicked people tended to do dumb things, like run, and I couldn't allow that to happen. I'm going after her. <laughs> I figured you'd say that. Marco chuckled, which did nothing to improve my mood. If you knew how I'd react, why on God's green earth did you let her take off without me? I debated the wisdom in committing fratricide, especially when said brother was a mob boss. Could get messy, too messy. And I might miss the guy in a year, or six. You needed time to cool off before you spoke to her. Trust me, bro. Things will go smoother once the two of you have your heads on straight. He paused as if he expected me to argue. When I didn't, he continued. And I need that info on Meriwether before you disappear. I have to know we aren't jumping to the wrong conclusions. If we are, it's a hell of a coincidence. Right. He exhaled a long, slow breath. There's been a lot of coincidences involving Enzo, starting with Joe's murder. His words stopped me cold. Marco had a point. Joe and Rebecca's accident had happened after they'd eaten dinner at Enzo's restaurant. 
Then there had been the trouble in Sicily before and during Gabe and Maggie's wedding. Shots fired over Enzo's head, armed gunmen in the crowd, fires in his restaurant and Shauna's apartment in New Orleans. Add in the business with Sophia poisoning the soup at the engagement party, and in one way, shape, or form, Enzo had been present at every dangerous turn. My mouth went dry. What are you saying? Either Enzo has some seriously bad timing, really good luck, or is the mark of the world's worst hitman. He chuckled again, only this time it sounded hollow. You should get your ass to the airport. The pilot for your chartered flight is charging me by the hour. For the life of me, I couldn't understand him. Why hire a plane when I could have gone with Frankie? So what if we needed time to cool off? If we couldn't work out our differences in eight or nine hours in a flying tin can, we never would. Call Giancarlo and make sure Frankie doesn't leave Trapani without me. No can do. He's willing to help keep her safe, but I'd rather not involve him in your Romeo and Juliet bullshit. You realize they both died at the end of the story, right? All the more reason not to tell him what's going on. I'll have her pilot make an unplanned stop due to mechanical issues. That should delay her for a few hours at least, Marco said. I'll see you for Christmas. Don't even think about disappointing pops. The holiday was the absolute last thing on my mind, but he was right. This could very well be our dad's last Christmas. Hey, do me a favor. The gifts I bought are in a box at my place. Have someone bring them to Comiso. Will do, he sighed. Use the time on your flight to get that info on Meriwether. I need it ASAP. And just like that, I understood his logic. He'd manipulated the situation to his advantage. Had Frankie and I flown out together, the chances of any work getting done were slim to none. Plus, by having us arrive on two separate flights, he'd given himself plausible deniability about our relationship if things went sideways with the Fratalanza. What the hell have I gotten myself into? Chapter 27, Frankie. International flights sucked, even when surrounded in luxury on the Marchioni's private jet. I'd tried to sleep, to read a book, to meditate, but nothing had worked. The time had oozed by like a file downloading over a dial-up connection. I couldn't stop thinking about Sophia and wondering what had happened to her. Margo was right. Tommaso wouldn't have any use for her if she refused to marry. Not to mention, our brother wasn't known for his patience. If she caused trouble. No, Sophia is smart. She'll do what she needs to do to survive. By the time the plane landed, I was more than ready to get on with the next leg of my journey. At least I could get some fresh air on the boat to my gilded prison cell on Ali Kudi. The pilot stepped into the main cabin, flashed me a smile, and ruined my already shitty day. We're in Rome. I had a million questions, but I settled on one. Not Trapani? Mechanical delay. I offered him a polite nod and turned to the window. I would have loved to stretch my legs on the tarmac, or better yet, go into the terminal and find a freaking phone. But I didn't bother to ask. The pilot and flight attendant worked for Marco. I was quite sure he'd told them to keep me under lock and key. I'll update you when I have more information. He opened the cabin door, stepped outside, and strode across the tarmac toward the terminal. Can I get you anything? The flight attendant spoke from behind me. I glanced over my shoulder and shook my head. She pressed her lips into a thin line. Miss. I shouldn't tell you this, but the plane was cleared before we left New Orleans. I'm not sure what's going on, but it isn't mechanical issues. Too exhausted to worry about the cause for the detour, I nodded. Like everything else in my life, whatever or whoever had grounded us was beyond my control. It's fine. Are you sure I can't get you anything? I took in her ringing hands and couldn't help but wonder how long she'd worked for the Marchionis. If I had to guess, I'd say not long. Actually, is there a phone I can use? I'd like to let my sister know I'm going to be late. Sure, but you'll need to hurry. She exhaled her nervous energy and motioned to the satellite phone behind the bar. 
I'll keep an eye out for the pilot. I'd solved one problem, but had bigger ones. Namely, I kept my contacts in my phone and had no idea who to call. Mia used a burner, and I couldn't remember the number to save my life, which in this case might not have been far off. Luckily, Iris had a number close enough to the old song about a woman named Jenny. I dialed the New Orleans area code and hummed the lyrics to get the rest of the digits. Hello? She sounded skeptical, as if expecting a solicitor to reply. Iris, it's Frankie. I need a huge favor. Oh my god, Frankie, where are you? I've been worried sick. Dante was here and the police and- Dante called the police? My brain whirled like a carnival ride. No, I did. I saw the news stories and your pick. The reporter didn't say they thought you were the murderer. I don't think you are either. What I mean is, I called because I thought you were in danger. She spoke so fast, I barely made sense of her words. It's okay. I know you wouldn't rat on me. Slow down and tell me what happened. She drew a deep breath. As soon as the detectives came and started asking questions about you, I knew I'd made a mistake. They just, they started going through Dante's things. I leaned against the bar to stay upright. Was Dante there? He came home while they were interrogating me. Iris's voice cracked. He was seriously pissed. I thought they'd arrest him for the way he was talking to them, but he got them out of here. Is he there now? I wasn't sure I could handle speaking to him. But then again, I wanted to hear his voice so bad it hurt. No, he left after the cops did. Where are you? Rome. I debated how much to tell her. The last thing I wanted was to put her in danger again. But at the same time, I needed someone to know where I was. Someone who wasn't a Marchioni. I'm going into hiding on Alicudi. Where is that exactly? Off the coast of Sicily. I glanced at the flight attendant and caught her staring with her mouth hanging open. Making a mental note to pick my words more carefully, I said, it's a good thing, I'll be safe. My plane's delayed, but I am meeting our cousin in Trapani. He's taking me by boat to the island. Our cousin? She went quiet. Oh, you're speaking in code? Yep. Giancarlo is meeting me at the docks. Can you let Mia know I'm okay? Mia is your sister, right? Where is her number? Iris seemed to catch on quick. My phone's dead, so I can't access it. I hated, and I mean hated, to share my login information with anyone. But I trusted her. You can get it by signing into the Apple Cloud. Use my personal email, and the password is Captain Marvel Rocks 345. Look for a 318 area code. Got it. You want me to tell her where you are going, right? I remembered the weird conversation I'd had with my sister after I'd picked up Enzo's DNA results. Actually, no. Just tell her I'm safe and will be in touch as soon as I can. The flight attendant waved her hands. He's coming. I have to go, Iris, but thank you. I hung up and hurried to my seat. She gave me a quick nod and busied herself in the small kitchen area. You really should eat. My stomach shriveled at the thought of food. Fruit or something light, please. The pilot walked through the door, wearing a no-nonsense expression. Ladies, you might as well make yourselves comfortable. Looks like we're going to be here for a couple of hours, at least. I think I'll go freshen up and get a nap. I stood and made a show of stretching. Long flight, stiff muscles. No sense in alerting him, I'd gotten out of my seat while he was gone. I'll serve your snack in the master suite. The flight attendant smiled too wide. I never got around to eating the sandwich and fruit she'd left for me. After a quick shower, I'd zonked out so hard, I slept through takeoff and landing. By the time I stepped off the plane in Trapani, the sun sat high in a cloudless sky. The winds blowing off the sea were chilly while on land. However, I had a feeling I'd need something heavier than Dante's t-shirt if I wanted to remain on deck once we hit open waters. Here, take this or you'll catch a cold. The flight attendant handed me a windbreaker. Thank you. It fit like a hefty bag, but it provided some warmth. I'd only made it a few feet when the pilot joined me on the tarmac. 
Holding a phone to his ear, he motioned for me to wait. Yes, sir, I understand. He glanced at me before turning away to continue his conversation. I squinted at the two dark sedans parked near the plane, but I couldn't see the drivers through the tinted windows. When I'd deplaned, I'd assumed one of the cars was there to take me to the harbor. But the longer we stood there, the more I wondered what the hell was going on. It dawned on me that I was home, or as close to it as I'd been since my father's funeral. Being back in Sicily didn't give me the warm, fuzzy feeling it should have. No, standing out in the open sent a chill through me. I glanced at the airport employees milling about. It didn't matter we were in Lazio territory. Any one of them could be a spy for my brother. I'm too exposed here. I motioned to the pilot and turned to the stairs. As much as I hated the thought of getting back on that infernal plane, I couldn't risk someone recognizing me. Dropping his phone in his pocket, he nodded to an approaching SUV. The vehicle came to a quick stop and the driver's side door opened. I'd expected my cousin Giancarlo or one of his men, but never in a million years did I think Dante would step out of the SUV. At the sight of him, my knees threatened to buckle. Wiping my eyes on the back of my hand, I stared, half expecting him to vanish like a mirage in the Sahara. Thank you, Dante nodded to the pilot. I'll take it from here. The longer he went without acknowledging my presence, the faster my pulse sped. But I couldn't seem to form a single word. He's here. That's all that matters. He's here with me. There's hope. Dante turned to me and his jaw tightened. Let's go. Chapter 28, Dante. Looking at her hurt, not looking at her was impossible. I was screwed and the worst part was, I didn't know what to believe. Frankie sure as hell didn't act like a murderer. She seemed tiny and scared, in an oversized jacket she'd likely borrowed from some unsuspecting fool. Glancing to the waiting cars, I waved a signal we were ready and turned to Frankie. Let's go. You shouldn't be here, it's not safe. I'm not safe, her voice cracked. You, not safe? Why would you think that? I was being an ass, but I didn't care. Why didn't you tell me Tommaso had Sophia? Her eyes met mine, and for the first time, I see it. How much she looked like her cold bitch of a sister. Before I could reply, a stunned Giancarlo Lazio stepped out of the nearest vehicle. Dante, I wasn't expecting you. The big guy stood well over six feet tall and was half as wide. He wasn't the kind of man I wanted to run into in a dark alley. In fact, had it not been for his wide grin, I might have turned tail and ran back to my SUV. Sorry about the change of plans. I'm going to accompany Frankie to Alacuri. He turned to her, opened his arms wide, and drew her in for a hug. Little cousin, good to see you. You too. It's been too long. She gave him a tentative smile and kissed his cheeks. He glanced between Frankie and me and raised a brow. Thankfully, he kept whatever questions he had to himself. The more family, the better, especially this time of year. Frankie's shoulders sagged. This wasn't exactly the Christmas she'd wanted. Dante, you are the brother of my brother of my brother-in-law. He scratched his chin. That makes us related, no? I didn't have the heart to correct him. Not when he was doing me and Marco a huge favor by helping us hide, Frankie. Especially not when said huge favor could get him killed. Close enough. Another fratellino, eh? He kissed my cheeks and drew me into a hug that most Americans would consider too freaking overzealous. Little brother works for me. Slapping his back, I pulled away. I would think you have enough big brothers. He frowned, seeming to rethink the statement. I was sorry to hear of Joe's death. He was a good man. He was. It had been years, but I still couldn't get used to referring to Joe in the past tense. Watching me, Giancarlo folded his arms. The uh, hit on Joe complicates things between the two of you, no? Understatement of the century. Frankie turned her head. I don't blame Frankie for the sins of her siblings, no matter how much I despise Sophia. That he hadn't mentioned Enzo shooting surprised me, but I chalked it up to the fact Enzo would survive while Joe hadn't. 
He motioned to the waiting car and gave me a look that told me I'd put my foot in a big steaming pile of shit. My mother is an Abruzzo. I didn't mean any disrespect. I noted the thickness of the windows as I slid into the back seat beside Frankie. While it didn't surprise me the capo of the Lazio family would have an armored car, it reminded me where I was, who I was, and what could happen to me if I wasn't careful. Giancarlo climbed into the front seat and nodded to the driver before turning to speak to us. What I mean to say is that my mother is close to the elder Abruzzo sisters. He nodded at Frankie. She would love to get to know you as well. I'd like that too. She'd barely lifted her chin from her chest since the topic of Joe had come up. Forgive this conversation, Francesca, but it needs to be had. He waited until she nodded before continuing. Sophia swears she didn't have anything to do with Joe and his wife's death. I didn't want to discuss what had happened to Joe and Rebecca. My goals were to make it to the port, put Frankie on the damned boat, and get some answers. However, I couldn't help but wonder what Giancarlo knew. And you believe her? Frankie stared out the window, but her occasional sniffle and deep breath told me she didn't like this topic any more than I did. Sophia's done some horrible things, but she always admits to them. He hitched a shoulder. Like attempting to poison three generations of my family? He frowned. Yes, she played a part in my father's scheme, but in many ways, she was a victim. I had a serious problem thinking of Sophia Abruzzo as a victim. Sure, Pietro Lazio had manipulated her, but she knew damned well what she was doing when she blackmailed a waitress into poisoning the soup. We will agree to disagree on that one. Desperate people will do desperate things, Giancarlo sighed. As for the matter of your brother and his wife, Sophia claims Enzo was the target and somehow Joe and Rebecca got in the way. Like Meriwether's ex-wife? Wrong place, wrong time, dead? Giancarlo said, I do not know for certain who is responsible, but I know Sophia. She does nothing that doesn't directly benefit her. What would she gain from killing Joe and his wife? Nothing. I scrubbed my hands over my face. It made sense. They were at Enzo's having dinner that night. They drove the same type of SUV. They'd even parked in Enzo's spot. We all did. It was a running gag that drove Enzo nuts. But what would anyone have to gain from killing Enzo? He was a chef and nowhere near the top of the Marchioni food chain. Giancarlo waved his hand. Enough talk of Sofia. We are almost to the harbor. We will need to be uh, on our toes. On my toes? Frankie tensed beside me. Are you expecting trouble? No, but it is good to be cautious. He handed Frankie a paper bag and me his sunglasses and the ball cap from his head. I did not bring a disguise for you. These will have to do. Thanks. I slid the designer shades on my face and did my best to hide my curls beneath the hat. Frankie pulled out a short blonde wig. Grazie, Giancarlo. Prego. He reached back and gave her knee a squeeze. For precautions, don't worry. I have my best men securing the harbor. She nodded and went to work twisting her long hair into a bun. Sitting so close and not touching her was more difficult than I'd anticipated. I wanted to comfort her, but I couldn't. Not until I got some answers. And after the conversation with Giancarlo, I had even more questions. Is the boat we're taking yours or a rental? Mine. He raised his chin as if anticipating my next question. Don't suppose you'd let me borrow it? I'd like some alone time with Frankie. As soon as the words left my mouth, I realized how they had sounded. She and I have a lot to discuss. Sure, yes, of course. Grinning, Giancarlo said, It's almost Christmas. Too cold for boating and swimming. I won't need it. The driver made a sharp turn into the marina. I caught myself white-knuckling the door handle. It's been a long time since I'd been chauffeured around Italy. Although I was technically an Italian driver, I didn't trust them. Do you have the address for the house on Alicuri? No, your brother has arranged for someone to meet you at the dock. He glanced out the window, sighed and cursed under his breath. We have company. Frankie glanced up and gasped. Oh no. I looked past him to two willowy brunettes standing near the dock. One huddled in her jacket while the other glared at the car. Who are they? He gave me an odd look. Mia and Ariana Abruzzo. You have not met them? No. Studying the sisters, I would have never pegged them as blood relations to Frankie. Then again, not every group of siblings looked as much alike as me and my brothers. Ari is sweet as cream, but watch out for Mia, he winked. He's right. Frankie seemed to shrink in on herself. 
How did they know to be here? I glanced between them, but I highly doubted Giancarlo had blabbed. I called Iris and asked her to reach out to Mia, just to tell her I was okay. I swear, I specifically told her not to tell Mia where I was going. The words came out of her mouth between quick breaths. Of course, she'd managed to call someone. Why let a little thing like her psychotic brother wanting to kill Enzo and sell her off to the highest bidder stop her from blabbing her whereabouts? There's nothing to be done about it now. I will buy you some time to put the wig on. He opened the car door and stepped out. Arms wide, Giancarlo spoke to the women in Italian. Cousins, what a surprise. It has been too long. Mia scowled, clearly unimpressed by his welcome. We aren't here to see you. Where is Francesca? He nodded toward the yacht. Perhaps we should wait where it is warm and not so exposed. Who is in the car? Mia squinted in my direction. This is bad. She shrank lower in her seat. I never should have trusted Iris. I squeezed her hand before I could think the better of it. Wait until he corrals them on the boat before you get out of the car. We can't risk a scene on the dock. Okay. I'm getting out, but I'll wait for you to go aboard. I stepped out of the car. Ari and Mia exchanged glances. You both know my fratellino, yes? Giancarlo shot me a hard look and nodded toward the boat. I don't believe we do. Mia watched me like a cat watches a catnip stuffed mouse, and I had no doubt she was thinking about doing a hell of a lot of purring and rubbing. Ladies, I'd prefer we have our introduction somewhere private. I motioned toward the sleek white yacht moored at the end of the dock. Be it my American accent or the fact she'd gotten a better look at my face, but they shared yet another knowing glance. Ah, so the rumors of our little sister and you are true. Mia's tone was almost as chilly as the breeze. Rumors often start with a kernel of truth, Giancarlo laughed, but it came out strained. He needed us out of sight, and I, for one, agreed. Shall we? This time I spoke to Ariana. She glanced at her sister. Mia nodded a fraction of an inch, and they headed for the boat. They'd only made it a few steps when Frankie jumped out of the car and ran toward us. Son of a bitch, does she ever listen? What are you two doing here? Frankie embraced her sisters. While Ari lingered in the hug, Mia pulled away and smoothed her hair. I didn't need a PhD in sibling relationships to know Mia wasn't overly fond of her baby sister. Your friend called to tell us you would be in Trapani. Ari's smile reminded me of days at the beach and ice cream sundaes, not the smile of a woman who'd spent months in hiding. Frankie turned to Mia. Tommaso has Sophia. Have you heard anything? Is she okay? Mia glanced between me and Giancarlo before turning her attention to her sister. No one has said anything to me. Are you sure? Yes. Frankie gave me a pointed look. I'm sorry to change the subject, but we don't have much time. This may be the only chance we have to see you for Christmas. Ari reached into her pocket and pulled out a small box. This is for you, from all of us. Mia edged closer. The others thought you should have it. Ari sighed. If Frankie noticed the dig, she didn't let on. Thank you. Your gifts are still in New Orleans. I can have my friend mail them, but they won't get here in time. Ari hugged her again. Seeing you is enough. Frankie dipped her chin. I hate that we won't be together again this year. Her reaction surprised me. We talked about the holidays a couple of times. She'd mentioned she rarely spent them with her family because of the extra expenses of taking time off work and traveling. However, I hadn't realized how much it had bothered her until that moment. I wanted to interrupt, to tell them we could work something out, to promise they'd celebrate not only Christmas, but the New Year and the Epiphany together. What the hell is wrong with me? I cleared my throat. We should get inside. Frankie glanced at me, her eyes shining with fresh tears. You're right. Giancarlo led Ari and Mia to the yacht, but Frankie held back. Once they were out of earshot, she turned to me. I meant what I said before. It's not safe. You should go home, Dante. I'm not going anywhere until we talk. That I couldn't read her expression pissed me off. She seemed to waffle between determined and terrified. Then again, maybe I'd read her perfectly. She looked me square in the eye. I didn't hurt Enzo. I'm not getting into this with you here. I wanted to grab her arm and drag her inside. Instead, I waited for her to huff and storm away. And of course, she didn't either. Frankie simply nodded wiped her cheeks on the back of her hand and climbed aboard. Wait. I touched her shoulder to get her attention. She turned her head in my direction, but avoided my gaze. 
what's the deal with Mia? She seems almost hostile, and that's putting it politely. I failed her and the others. Forcing myself to keep my voice down, I asked, how? Because you didn't find anything on my family? Among other things, yes. She hurried into the solarium before I could ask more. Giancarlo handed each of us a bottle of water. I have wine if you prefer. Grazie, but Ari and I can't stay. Mia glanced between us and lowered her voice. We're going south to stay with. She curled her lips into more of a snarl than a smile. Friends. I had a feeling her lack of specifics had to do with her not trusting me. Not that I blamed her. Ari practically bounced in her chair. Frankie, open your gift before we go. But it's not Christmas. She held the tiny package tighter, as if afraid it would vanish. Now, Francesca, every minute we wait is a minute closer to the grave. Mia's sour expression reminded me of my mother's after I'd failed English in the third grade, only with less love. And take that god-awful wig off. You look ridiculous. Once again, Frankie didn't seem bothered by her bitchy sister's comments. After removing her wig, she gave the package a little shake before methodically loosening the ribbons and folding the plain brown paper. Mia rolled her eyes. At this rate, I could have finished a bottle of Giancarlo's wine. Frankie opened the lid on the black velvet box and gasped. Tears brimmed her eyes as she glanced between her sisters. Papa's St. Christopher medallion? He would want you to have something of his. Ari helped her baby sister fasten the gold chain. Buon Natale. Merry Christmas. Frankie embraced her again. When she pulled away, she turned to Mia. I know you were angry at me, but it is good to see you. Mia's reply consisted of a curt nod and an even curter tone. Ariana, we must go. Giancarlo pulled me onto the deck while the sisters said their goodbyes. Do not share these with Frankie until you're offshore. But the plan to insist that Mia and Ariana stay in Trapani. They will be safe in the Lazio compound. Why not tell Frankie? It dawned on me a moment too late. He doesn't trust her. The fewer people who know where they are, the better. He glanced through the windows at the women. Francesca has been out of the life for too long. She should have known better than to tell anyone her travel plans. Even if it was to get a message to her sisters. She has put us all at risk. While I felt like an ass for assuming Giancarlo thought she was up to no good, I disagreed with him on one fact. Frankie might have spent the previous decade away from Sicily, but when she needed something, she used the Mafia playbook as well, if not better than the rest of us. Chapter 29, Frankie. I watched my sisters walk back to their car and drive away with an odd sense of relief. When I'd asked Iris to get a message to them, I never thought she'd tell Mia and Ari where I was going. Nor did I think they would show up in Thrapani. Not only was it reckless, it was out of character for Mia. Anyone with eyes or ears could tell she didn't care for me. Why did she come? There had to be a reason for the visit. And I doubted it had anything to do with giving me our father's medallion. My sisters weren't the only ones who'd showed up unannounced. While part of me was so happy to see him, I wanted to throw myself into his arms and beg him to come with me. The saner part knew it was a bad idea. We were in mafia country. Any one of the men on the docks could be in my brother's back pocket. If someone recognized us, stop catastrophizing what you can't control and focus on what you hope like hell you can fix. I paced the solarium. But rather than admiring the sleek black leather couches and polished teak, I couldn't take my eyes off Dante and Giancarlo. They stood beside the yacht with their heads together as if sharing secrets. Secrets, I suspected, that involved me. I hadn't missed the hard set of Dante's jaw or the accusations in his sea green eyes. I also hadn't missed his concern when he'd asked about Mia's crappy attitude and I definitely caught the way he kept staring. John Carlo gave Dante a quick hug. Ciao, ciao. Dante waited until he'd walked away before turning and glancing over the boat. Careful to stay out of view of the marina, I stepped onto the deck. The wind had picked up, and the temperatures had dropped since my plane had landed. 
winters in Sicily were considered mild by most standards. But I wouldn't want to spend time in the crystal blue sea. I huddled deeper in the windbreaker the flight attendant had given me. He glanced at me and frowned. You should go inside where it's warm. I'd prefer a little fresh air, if that's okay. He removed his jacket, reached across the railing, and handed it to me. Put this on. I slid into the soft leather and couldn't help but smile as the familiar scent of his cologne filled my nose. I hope Nico has some warm clothes at the villa. If not, he'll have to hide under the blankets until spring. Dante's lips twitched as if he'd stopped himself from smiling. Instead, he pressed his lips together and nodded. I'm sure there will be something you can wear. I absolutely hated the tension between us, but his initial reaction gave me hope. Thank God, I'm not the only one who's conflicted. One of John Carlo's men approached Dante. She's fueled and restocked. Thanks, I'll take it from here. He slipped the man some cash and muttered something to him I couldn't hear. The guy nodded, shoved the money in his pocket, and strolled away without a backward glance. Curiosity got the better of me. What did you say to him? Nothing much. He seemed to realize he'd barked at me and sighed. Since I don't have his loyalty, I tried to buy his silence. Did it work? Stupid question. We wouldn't know if the bribe was successful until it was too late. However, I wasn't ready to end the conversation. Even making small talk with Dante felt like home. Let's hope so. Dante didn't seem convinced. I wanted to believe if Giancarlo trusted the men, we could trust them too. But I knew better. Loyalty and the mafia only extended to the family one worked for. And even then, money had a way of testing the strongest devotion. Before boarding, Dante inspected the side of the yacht closest to the dock. Something wrong? The longer he took to get underway, the thinner my nerves became until I felt as though I'd snap. Call me paranoid, but I don't want to be caught by surprise in the middle of the Tiramin Sea. Way to help calm me down. Once on deck, he hung over the railing and inspected the opposite side and the helm. Everything good? I pulled his jacket tighter around me. He turned toward me. I didn't know what he saw in my expression, but his face softened. Yep, everything's in order. I didn't mean to scare you. It's a long trip, and I'm not familiar with this vessel. But you'd know how to operate it, right? I was taking out my family's yacht well before I learned how to drive a car. He seated himself in the captain's chair and turned the key. The fact that he blew out a breath when the boat started without a hitch sent my already over-adrenaline-flooded mind into a meltdown. You thought there was a bomb. I sat, because I didn't trust my legs to hold me up. You did, right? That's why you were checking the sides. Me? No. He smirked. I stared, unable to form a word. Dante smiled at me for the first time since I'd left his bed what felt like a millennia ago. Okay, maybe the thought crossed my mind. I shuddered. Let's get out of here. Dante surprised the hell out of me when he took my hand and brought it to his lips. Regardless of everything going on, I don't want to see you blown to smithereens. Um, thanks? I eased as far away from him as possible. Not because he'd offended me, because for a few seconds, things felt right between us. Your fingers are frozen. Go downstairs and warm up. I'd rather not. I was cooped up on a plane for almost 20 hours. Besides, we need to talk. I hated to ruin the moment, but the sooner I told him everything, the sooner he'd either hate me or forgive me. That we do. Muttering, he checked the knobs and gauges. But right now, I need to focus on getting this beauty out of the marina without scratching Giancarlo's paint job. I gazed over the shoreline to the craggy mountains and the towers of the cathedral. I forget how beautiful it is here, Trapani. Once he'd pulled away from the dock, he glanced back toward the city. Sicily, Italy, all of it. There's nothing like it in the US. He nodded, but the tension in his jaw returned. 
We'll be there in two or three hours. Plenty of time for that talk. And for you to hack into Harrison Merriweather's email. What? Marco wants something that can pin Enzo's shooting on Merriweather or Governor Calhoun's right-hand man, Robert Becker. He folded his arms. I spent the majority of the flight from New Orleans to Trapani digging up everything I could find. I couldn't make sense of why Marco would want to frame someone for Enzo's shooting. Okay. The blonde was Merriweather's ex-wife. She was meeting Dahlia and Shauna for lunch at Enzo's. They were trying to get dirt on the senator. Dante rubbed his hand over the back of his neck. Dahlia placed him at the second shooting. Could someone else have fired the gun? Someone other than Tommaso's guys? Becker planted a bomb in Leo's car. It was meant to kill him and Dahlia. Gunner was with them. I gripped the console to stay upright. Are they? They're fine. But it would be a favor to society if he were put away for a very long time. He frowned. I didn't come up with the proof Marco needs, but my plane landed before I could hack into their emails. Sure, I can help you. Thanks. He turned back to the control panel. Desperate to keep him talking, I said the first thing that popped into my mind. I didn't shoot Enzo. There's video of you running toward him, calling his name. Your hand was in your pocket. His grip tightened on the wheel. That he'd all but accused me stung. But as much as it hurt, I figured if we could get through this, we could get through anything. I know, but I didn't do it. Why were you there? Dante's sharp voice cut straight through me. Recoiling, I lowered my voice. My software worked for once. I got an alert on my phone. What kind of alert? I had two, actually. The first was when the blonde woman was shot, and the second was when the facial recognition registered Pasquale Pulisi. The memories of the footage flooded me, along with the bone-numbing fear. I tried to call you, but my phone went dead. He gave me side eye. That's convenient. Is it? I barked out a humorless laugh. Think about it. I'd spent the night with you and headed out to the lab first thing. Did I charge my phone in the penthouse? Lab. The color drained from his face. Why would you evade the security team, sneak out of the building, and risk your life to go to a lab? You're not. What the hell is he asking me? Not what? Pregnant. Dante choked on the word. God, no. This time I laughed for real, although maybe I shouldn't have considering his reaction. I'm on the pill, plus we've always used condoms. Sorry, I didn't mean to imply anything. Gabe's daughter Ella was a condom baby, and I'm assuming Gunner wasn't planned. And Zach, Joe's oldest? Once again, he tightened his grip on the wheel. Tell me what you know about your sister's involvement with my brother's murder. The change of subject left me reeling. I'd finally worked up the courage to tell him about Enzo, but he wanted to talk about Sophia and Joe, again. She had nothing to do with it. Tommaso ordered the hit. Even though Giancarlo had told him the same thing, I'd expected Dante to dismiss me. Instead, he simply nodded and opened up the throttle, increasing the speed. Did your father know? Now's my chance to lay it all on the table. No, he didn't. My dad would have never signed off on it. I toyed with the St. Christopher medallion around my neck. Dante glanced over. How can you be so sure? Because Joe wasn't the target. Enzo was. Enzo? Why would your brother put a hit on a chef? He seemed surprised, but not as much as I would have thought. I had the feeling he'd spoken to Marco, but I doubted Dante knew about Enzo's paternity. Tommaso didn't order the hit. He did it himself. I swallowed past the emotion clogging my throat. That makes no sense, not even for your idiot brother. Dante shook his head. Tommaso was the heir apparent to the Abruzzo seat on the Frate Lanza. Why would he risk an unauthorized hit? I debated doing as Marco had asked and keeping quiet about Enzo, but I couldn't, not anymore, not after everything that had happened. 
because Enzo is my half-brother and can challenge his position. Dante's entire body jolted as if I'd tased him. You have proof? Yes. That's why I was at the lab. I pulled the crumpled DNA results from my pocket. He glanced from the paper to my face. My God. I wanted so badly to hold him, to tell him I was sorry, to promise I'd take the secret to the grave. But I didn't dare touch him, not when his anger was as thick as the sea air. His mouth fell open. The bloody bandage? I couldn't stomach the disgust in his expression. Not my proudest moment, but yes. Enzo and Shauna just found out they're expecting a baby. This is going to kill him. And my family? Fuck, it's going to blow us apart. He spoke as if he'd forgotten I was there. And then he turned to me, and I wished he hadn't. Never. Not even when he found I'd lied about my name to spy on his family, had he looked at me with such cold, hard hatred. I'm sorry. I was desperate, am desperate. My sisters, who else knows? Not only had he interrupted me, he'd waved his hand as if I were discussing what shoes to wear to dinner. Sophia suspected it the night Pietro Lazio had his breakdown. I sighed. But Tommaso must have known much longer. Dante narrowed his eyes. What aren't you telling me? I glanced over the water to make sure there were no rocks or smaller boats in our path, and because I couldn't stand the way he was glaring at me. Marco has suspected it since the night he took over as the Marchioni Capo. So has Nicolina. Dante focused straight ahead. Is there anything else you're keeping from me? Tell me the truth or I swear to God, I'll leave you on Alicudi to rot. That's it, I've lost him. I'd seen him angry, as in ready to strangle me angry. But I'd never seen him so on edge. He felt like a hand grenade with a missing pin. No, I swear, that's everything. I rested my hand on his arm, but he didn't as much as blink. I'd planned to go to Enzo, tell him the truth and let him make the decision of how to proceed, but I won't. I have the only copy of the test results. I'll burn them, I promise. I don't want to hurt you or your family. Still staring at the water. Since when does an Abruzzo care about hurting a Marchione? Since I fell in love with you. My voice cracked along with the last solid piece of my heart. He drew a deep breath. I need some space. Should I go below? I didn't want to leave him, but I understood. I'd likely need time to process the news too. Yes, no, I don't care. He eased off the throttle to slow the boat. I'll go work on hacking into those email accounts. He didn't as much as nod. My heart broke for him. But at the same time, he wasn't the only one who needed a breather. I'd done everything my sisters had asked of me. Given up a year of my life, torpedoed my career, hurt the first man I'd fallen in love with. And yet, I'd ended up back where I'd started. In Sicily, afraid, alone, and locked inside a beautiful cage. Chapter 30, Dante. Alone in the cockpit, I cut the engine and stared out over the brilliant blues and greens. I loved New Orleans, but Sicily was home. The people, the smells, the water, all of it reminded me of my childhood. But how much of my childhood was a lie? I rested my forehead on the wheel and tried to ignore the sick feeling in my gut, the queasy admission that I'd always known there was something different with Enzo. The way my mother doted on him, the way my father pushed him away. I thought back to my conversation with Marco before I'd left Louisiana. He'd known. He'd known Enzo wasn't a Marchione. He'd known about the DNA test and Frankie. And he'd probably known Sophia wasn't responsible for Joe's death and he didn't say a fucking word. My mom? She'd obviously cheated on my dad, but how many times? How many men? 
Were any of us who we thought we were? Was I a Marchione? Did biology matter? It sure as hell matters to Frankie and her sisters. But Enzo? Will this change his life? Really? Enzo had wanted the recognition and power his entire life, but he'd given up the chance to become the Marchione Capo before he and Shauna were married. I doubted he'd want to challenge Tommaso for the seat on the Fratellanza. Not when it would mean dragging Shauna and their unborn child into the Cosa Nostra. I turned to my seat and watched Frankie click away on the laptop. She didn't shoot Enzo. Hell, if Giancarlo was right, Sophia wasn't responsible for Joe's death. But the lies and half-truths how can I trust her? She'd put her life on the line for her sisters. Hell, she'd stolen a man's blood in the hopes a DNA test would convince him to help her. But she doesn't know Enzo. He'll never go for it. I walked to her side. You need sunscreen. I don't burn. She glanced in my direction before turning her attention back to the laptop. Besides, it's winter. The sun still reflects off the water. Trust me, you need sunscreen. She snatched the ball cap from my head and put it on. There, problem solved. I wanted to laugh and drag her into my arms and apologize for doubting her. It would be so easy to let my guard down and pick up where we'd left off in the penthouse, but I couldn't. Not yet. Not when she'd lied about so many things. For now, I play it safe. Keep her at arm's length until I figure this out. Frankie did a seated happy dance. I'm in Meriwether's email. That was fast. I couldn't help but smile. Send Leo the login information. She typed out an email before closing the laptop. Are you okay? I will be. I pointed in the direction of a distant island. That's Alicudi. How long until we arrive? An hour or so. The marina's on the other side. I debated on how to tell her Enzo was a lost cause, but couldn't find the words. Dante. She laced her fingers with mine. I'm really sorry. I should have told you about Enzo before. I mean, I tried a couple of times, but something always came up. I can see how it would be difficult to throw, by the way, your mother had an affair with my dad, into a conversation. Frankie nodded and glanced away. It's gross to think about. That's putting it mildly. I kissed the back of her hand. You should know, Enzo turned down a seat on the Fratellanza. I don't think he will help you. I meant what I said. I'm going to destroy the results. The honesty in her voice unraveled a knot in my gut. I had absolutely no reason to trust her, but I did. No, too much of our lives has been decided for us because of who our parents are. Enzo has a right to know and to make his own decisions. It's not just our parents. It's everything. The rules, the expectations, the mob demands absolute control over every aspect of our lives. Frankie wiped her eyes. I was stupid to think I could find a way out. I knew exactly how she felt. Not that long ago, I had said the same thing to Marco, but he'd done it. He'd sacrificed himself to buy the rest of our freedom. Miracles happen. Just don't get your hopes up about Enzo. We'll have to find another way to help your sisters. Her expression brightened. We? I hitched a shoulder. Well, see, that's the thing. No matter what happens between us, I'm not going to see you married to some crusty old Italian mafioso. Frankie folded in on herself as if to ward off another blow. You don't have to help me. Lifting her chin, I put my face in her line of vision. I want to. But why? I mean, after everything I've done. Because despite it all, I freaking love you. What else am I going to do for the foreseeable future? She furrowed her brow. I don't understand. I shrugged. You've proven you can't be left alone without getting into some sort of trouble. The way I see it, I have two choices. Stay with you and continue to work together, or throw you overboard. She grinned, but I recognized it for what it was, an attempt to hide her disappointment. Work together? That's all I can give you right now. I refused to make promises I couldn't keep. Until the battle between my head and my heart was over, I'd keep my feelings to myself. I understand. She eyed me and then the water. But there's another option. I could swim for it. Are there sharks? There are sharks in every ocean, Frankie. I love that she could find humor in the middle of a shitstorm. Then I guess I'm stuck with you. She turned and gave me a real smile. I'm thankful to be with you for Christmas and that I was able to see my sisters. I'd like to banish sharks and crooked politicians. 
I'm thankful for sharks, because they're keeping you from jumping overboard. Crooked politicians, because what else would cable news cover? Frankie laughed. What would you banish? Too many things to list. Do you think we can have a tree or do something special for Christmas? Absolutely, come on. I dragged her with me to the cockpit. Ali Kuti is beautiful. You should see the uninhabited side from the water. It was silly, but I thought Frankie would enjoy the unspoiled view of the rocky cliffs. Okay, but can we hike there one day? You know, when we're done with work? She rested her hand on my shoulder. Absolutely. There are a few grottos and waterfalls we can visit when the weather warms up. I turned the key, but nothing happened. Do you think we'll be here that long? Maybe. Careful not to flood the engine, I tried to start the yacht two more times. What's wrong? Frankie slipped out of my jacket and rested it on the back of her chair. Are we out of gas? I double-checked the gauge. Three quarters of a tank. Hang tight, I'll be right back. Okay. She didn't look okay, she looked worried. Relax, I know my way around boats. I lifted the hatch and descended the narrow stairs to the engine. Checking the most common problems, I verified we did in fact have gas. Next, I made sure the tank air vent was open. Nothing seemed to miss. Kneeling, I checked the gas lines for kinks. My heart stopped beating. There, tucked into the corner, was a black duffel bag chained to a piece of PVC pipe. From the looks of it, the metal links had compressed the line. Everything okay? Frankie called from above. Grab a couple of life vests. I tried to keep my voice steady as I inched closer to the bag. From the outside, I couldn't tell if the fuel line was rigged to the bomb and it caused us to stall or if whoever had chained the bag had gotten lucky. Dante, you're scaring me. She stepped onto the top rung of the ladder. Me too, sweetheart. Me too. Get the vests. I'll be right there. As slow as my trembling hands would move, I pulled the bag open. Inside sat a phone duct taped to three rectangular shaped objects covered in plastic wrap. I squinted at the screen on the cell. Fuck me, five minutes? Panicking, I tugged on the pipe. If I could break it, I might be able to toss the bag overboard. Whoever had planted the device had done a good job of ensuring it stayed in place. The harder I pulled, the more I jostled the bag and risked detonating the explosive by accident. No time, we have to swim for it. I bounded up the ladder. I need you to listen, okay? Dante, what is it? Hold a vest and jump. Don't put it on. It will slow you down. Just hold it and swim for the island. Do you understand? Frankie paled. What? Why? We'll get hypothermia and sharks. You said there were sharks. No, we won't. Not for an hour or so. The water isn't that cold, and there are no sharks. I said that to keep you with me. I grabbed her shoulders and put my face directly in front of hers. There's a bomb. You have to do this. She stilled and stared, as if she hadn't quite understood me. Suddenly, the lies, the betrayals, the heartache, none of it mattered. I didn't have another second to waste, but I couldn't let her go without telling her the truth. I love you, always have, always will. Nothing can change that. Her eyes widened. Are you coming with me? I'll be right behind you. Go. I pushed her toward the stern. Jump off the swim platform. She ran to the back of the yacht, glanced over her shoulder, and jumped into the sea. Bile rose in my throat. I should have told her to go from the stern. The explosion will blow out the aft. Dante? Her voice sounded far away, but not far enough. Coming, swim, damn it. I grabbed the waterproof first aid bag from the cockpit and the life vest Frankie left on the bench. Sending up a prayer, I dove after her. I swam as fast as I could while carrying a flotation device and bag. After a few seconds, I left them behind in favor of putting more distance between me and the yacht. I caught up with a wide-eyed and frightened Frankie. It's going to blow soon. When it does, we dive under as deep as we can, okay? Teeth chattering, she nodded. Hold my hand and don't let go. I swam toward the shore, tugging her along with me. We made it a few more yards when the world exploded behind us. Hoping like hell she'd held her breath, I pulled her down with me. What seemed like a good idea at the time didn't work as well as I'd hoped. Debris fell around us, and in the chaos, I lost Frankie's hand. Making matters worse, I couldn't find her in the churning water. I surfaced and called her name, but she was nowhere to be found. Frankie! Something heavy smashed into my skull, and blood clouded my vision. Frankie! 
Struggling to stay afloat and conscious, I continued to cry out her name until water filled my lungs. This has been part three of Gin and Trouble, The Bourbon Street Bad Boys Club, Book Five. Written by Catherine M. Hurst. Narrated by Aaron Shedlock and Virginia Rose. If you enjoyed this audiobook, please subscribe to Catherine's channel where you can find the conclusion of Gin and Trouble, along with more of Catherine's paranormal and contemporary romance novels.